Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is John Palfrey, and on behalf of the Berkman Center and also the Harvard Law School Library and also the Harvard Bookstore, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Harvard Law School and thrilled that you've come out to hear us uh, talk about a new book that we have been very excited to share with the world uh, here today called Interop. Um, I'm thrilled to be here also with my friend and co-author, Urs Gasser, with whom uh, I've written this book, and I'm going to do a very brief overview of the core argument of the book. Urs is then going to take us through a series of examples and perhaps show a few little videos along the way, and then hopefully we'll have a conversation with all of you. Um, the event, just so you know, is being recorded but not webcast live, so should you care to ask a question or um, throw tomatoes or do something else that will get recorded, you are being recorded for posterity. Um, and we'd love to hear you say your name and so forth and do that, but since one of our topics is privacy, we wanted to disclose this in advance. Um, we highly encourage tweeting. We are using pound interop, so uh, the um, hash sign interop, uh, as a way to curate the conversation a little bit. And there will be a reception just after this in uh, the uh, session that section out here, and we very much hope that you will stick around uh, for uh, the reception afterward. So I'm just going to give a really brief uh, intro to the topic and then turn it over to Urs. The topic of interop is something that seems on its face to be very dull and very techy and very geeky. And uh, to be honest, we started with this very dull and very geeky topic, and we're asking questions as part of a research project about whether or not higher levels of interoperability led to greater innovation. That was our core initial question, which sounds really, really academic, uh, and it is, and actually extraordinarily important from the perspective of the development of complex systems in the world, but a relatively narrow version of uh, the kind of question that uh, might result in a book of this sort. Um, and what happened over the course of working on this book and with a wonderful team of people over five or six years was we got more and more interested in how interoperability actually helped to explain a whole lot of different things. And we got quite a ways outside of our ordinary comfort zone of information technologies into a variety of fields and then sought to do something more ambitious than simply to explain this relationship between interop and IT and innovation, but rather to develop a theory of interoperability and how it related to a whole bunch of other questions associated with an increasingly globalized world and one where information and technology is increasingly mediating our lives in lots of ways. So that's the overall trajectory. It was going from a very narrow technical question about technology and data to something that we think relates to humans and how we interact and how institutions uh, work together. And it's our sense that it also helps to explain a number of phenomena that we see in the headlines every day. And that's, in a way, what we're seeking to do, is to make this topic of interoperability be something that is useful and pragmatic, um, as well as being highly theoretical and, um, and constructive in an academic sense. You have no doubt been following the fact that Facebook IPO'd, and I think the way in which the story has been spun is largely about the spiral after the initial offering um, based on some shenanigans associated with how the IPO was handled. And of course, that's a very important story. Um, but we see sort of a story behind the story in a way that has to do with interoperability. One of the debates, I think, about Facebook has been why is it plausibly worth $100 billion when it goes out uh, initially, or $80 billion, or whatever it is um, falling toward, when on the basis of sort of a basic academic, uh, um, economic calculation about its revenues and advertising, it's very hard to justify that amount. And I think one of the real reasons why it is so valuable and may well be worth something on the order of tens of billions of dollars, and why companies like Friendster and MySpace and others that had similar technologies and similar general approaches have rounded to zero or become worth next to nothing, and maybe even why LinkedIn is worth more like 10 billion and Facebook is like a lot more, is its approach to interoperability. The extent to which, there are of course wonderful other things about Facebook, but one of the things that they've done is from the start built themselves into the technology, into the systems broadly, and into our lives in ways that make interconnection, something that may well be enduring and that be very hard in some respects to pull Facebook out of the technology and out of our experience. So um, the way in which they have done this, I think, has wonderful benefits for the company in terms of being hard to replace and hard to extract 
from our lives and from the technology, it also comes with some problems, some problems well known around privacy and security in particular. I think this is a really good example when we say the promise and perils of interoperability of how that all gets rolled up into one example, and we'll play out some of these, uh, these stories a little bit further. Um, the second one has to do um, with the extreme spread of viruses that happen across uh, any number of, bless you, different complex systems uh, um, in this globalized world. This is just one example um, where the flame virus has infected uh, 189 systems in Iran. It's no longer the case that a malware out outbreak is something that is possibly localized. This is something where there are huge costs potentially to our race to interconnect the World Wide Web. And it's, again, there are wonderful things about interoperability, but there are also extremely high systemic costs. And we have to figure out how do we build the firewalls or the break walls in between different systems and don't let contagion spread um, uh, consistently as we build, as we rush to build these extremely uh, interconnected systems. These are problems that we simply couldn't have anticipated um, a few dozen years ago. Or if we could have, we didn't. Um, a third example, just from this week, um, is the uh, one most furthest flung from our core IT example, but which I think helps uh, explain the spread of this idea beyond the IT zone and into other fields. Um, it has to do with the um, failure of the banking system in Greece, but its effect on lots of other systems. And one of the ways in which we got into interoperability was, of course, through this IT lens. But then we started going historically and saying, what are examples where across different systems we have tried to make things interconnect? Um, and two of the examples that came up really quickly were transportation, where we started with different train systems in different countries, and then started to figure out how do we uh, have the rail gauges be at the same distance so we could run trains <coughs> across countries. In the United States, there's a wonderful story of the golden spike being driven into the middle of the ground in the 1860s, which joined um, what they called the two great oceans of the world in that uh, wonderful colonial sense of the, um, uh, of the era, but where we were able to have not just trains, but ideas and people uh, and goods flow across the country once we had driven in that spike. And another example of this is currency. The idea that we don't have one currency around the world, and yet we can have global trade. It's not all the same, but we have ways in which we can trade money across different borders. Um, and I think that's something that has been a great globalization story. It has allowed for growth and the creation of jobs and so forth. But I think it also creates problems that we have to figure out how to solve as we race to interconnect more and more. And I think the Greece example is a really good example of how it can go bad. So the notion that bad debts in one country can be such a big problem, not just for the Germans or the Swiss or the French uh, in the example of Europe, but also for all of us, for uh, the Americans and otherwise. What do the Greek defaults have to do with uh, our system in the United States? The fact that we are so interdependent um, and interconnected, I think, is a big part of that story. So it goes from the very precise and classic IT example um, to the issues, I think, of the global economy broadly. Um, one of the things that we uh, seek to do also in this book is to situate the argument about interop in uh, both very specific definitional terms and then um, in a broader frame. So um, in the world of technology, when we talk about interoperability, we almost always think about it in a really straightforward way. We, we adopt a, a simple definition. It's based on one that is usually kicked around through the NIST framework. Um, but so basically the idea of, of uh, an ability to transfer and render useful data across systems. Um, but ultimately, I think where we come out in this book is that's an insufficient definition for what we think um, interoperability is. And, and more broadly, we see interop as the art and science of working together. This will become clear, I think, over the course of these examples. But we see interoperability playing out not just in terms of technology and data going across systems, um, those are important uh, layers of the story, but also at human and, inter and institutional levels where the examples like the Greek crisis um, seem to me to make uh, more sense. Uh, I'd also like, before turning over to Urs, uh, to make the case that the project that we're working on here is one that is more than just a book, ultimately. We've thought about this as an inquiry into this really interesting global phenomena of interoperability. And we've had the great pleasure of working with lots of uh, friends and colleagues on a series of case studies over a number of years. And uh, we've thought about this as something that is an extension of the book um, and is a, is a way in which, if you want to go much deeper into these examples, um, we've put a series of case studies across the web. So there are ones that we did several years ago on this core question 
of innovation and interoperability. Um, but with the help of many uh, wonderful people in the room, uh, we have done uh, case studies across a very broad uh, group of topics. They're up, uh, openly available on the web. There are ones on cloud computing. You see Matt Becker's up there, who's a um, uh, Harvard Law School student. Um, the one on electronic data interchange. Um, one on intermodal connectors, one on the smart grid. I see um, the smart grid author, uh, Paul, over there. So the way we've seen this project has been um, to do a whole lot of case studies. Adam Holland worked on many of these as well, um, all on the web, that then, in essence, get rolled up and distilled into this one, uh, one argument. But we hope that the book project, in a way, will be um, not just uh, a single distillation in uh, a printed form, but rather an extended argument that is uh, out across the web. And we hope as it gets reviewed and otherwise that we'll also be in a broader conversation about Interop. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to Urs, but by way of thanking um, this great team of Paul and others who have worked with us on the project. Thank you, Tom. So uh, as Tom just uh, mentioned, we've done a number of case studies, uh, funny ones, fun ones, uh, complex ones, straightforward ones from daily life, uh, cell phones, we'll talk more about that, to highly complex systems. Um, and what we'd like to do over the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes is to um, explore with you, discuss with you five such examples or stories and share with you some general observations. Uh, these five examples are placeholders for many other cases we've studied, uh, but they're illustrative for some um, bits and pieces of the theory of interoperability that we actually uh, try to develop in our book. So let us start with the first one, which is actually a very big vision, a big interoperability problem or challenge, and that is how can we improve our lives in cities? How can we make our cities smarter using technology? I thought we start with a video for a change. Uh, so watch this video, which is actually from IBM. Okay, Sam, have you decided where you'd like to study when you graduate? Don't know. What about New York? It's like, got an awesome club and music scene. New York? Well, I'm sure it has, but... And it's got a great education system, great research facilities, schools that use cloud computing. I know, I know, but um, how safe is it? I mean, we've got some great schools here, too. These days, New York's safe as. Oh. It's not shoot 'em up like on TV. Really? Yeah, like the cops, ambulance and fire service are all interconnected and share information. Well, I guess, but all that traffic congestion and pollution won't be good for your asthma. OK. Well, what about Dublin or Stockholm, then? <laughs> They've, like, integrated their traffic systems. So there's one ticket for trains, buses, ferries and toll roads. Oh, handy. People get alerts if there are delays, so they can choose the best way to get where they want to be. In Stockholm, they've cut down greenhouse gases by, like, 40% or something. But the cold and your asthma? Well, what about Spain? Spain. Spain's nice and warm. Mm. And there, they have interconnected health services. So I won't have to run around getting my medical history to different doctors, specialists and pharmacies. They'll have it all on one single electronic health record. Well, that's smart. But what about the water and utilities? Yeah. You don't want to live in a place unless it has a guaranteed energy supply and good quality water. Oh, you mean like in Malta? Malta. Yeah. They're like building a smart grid that links the power and water systems. Oh. It'll detect the leaks and give more control to the people who buy water and electricity. All right, we stop here because they go around the globe and at many more countries, right? But um, this example is illustrative, this big vision that just illustrates how much we depend when we think about our future as a society, uh, here in the example of living in cities, on sharing of information, on getting interconnectedness right, which is the story of interoperability uh, we are interested in. There are a number of, of examples uh, that we can, or observations we can distill from this particular uh, uh, narrative. Uh, the first one is many of the things, cases we've studied, whether it's in transportation, as Tom mentioned, whether it's the smart grid, the future of efficient energy supply, um, whether it's air traffic control, many other areas. Um, it turns out that Interop is, in a way, a key success factor for making these future infrastructures uh, that are so important 
for our economies, for our uh, societies and cultures, that interop is really the key piece. So we need to understand interoperability very well uh, when we think about the solution uh, to some of the most pressing problems we face, really from uh, um, the healthcare crisis to uh, climate change, wherever you look, this question of how much interconnectedness, how much flow of information across systems, that's the driving question in many instances. A second um, observation from, from the story, and that's also kind of a key characteristic of interoperability, is interop is not a black and white thing. It's not something that uh, uh, is uh, either there or not. Uh, the flow of information across systems uh, maps along a spectrum. Uh, we know that from daily experience. I assume many of you are, are traveling quite a bit, and sometimes you know we need adapters for our uh, uh, power cables, right, uh, to carry with us. So this is kind of somewhere uh, it's a hack to create interoperability, but it's not the perfect interoperability where you could have one plug and travel around the world and plug it into uh, the the plugs there, um, and. Um, uh, of course, that not only uh, this degree, different degrees of interop, not only is experienced in, in simple systems like you know an adapter or a dongle for the computer here, uh, but also in complex systems. Um, take the um, alliance of airlines. Uh, they, I'm sure many of you again, travel example, have experienced difficulties. You uh, say book a flight, make a flight le reservation. Uh, uh, with uh, Swiss Air or Swiss, right? Uh, and then you fly United, which is in the same alliance, but actually there is a translation problem quite often that the seat you reserved within the Swiss system didn't perfectly translate into the United system and you end up with a window seat instead of an aisle seat. Uh, so uh, if you look behind the scenes, these reservation systems, they are hugely complex uh, systems. And so you see again, uh, a certain degree of inter interoperability. Actually, you're on the right flight, uh, but then uh, you know you don't have the right seat. So it's not. You should be glad you didn't get a middle seat, which is what I get. You're, you're such a big so so flyer. <laughs> you get messed up into the aisle. What also, uh, what is a kind of common thread across? Oh, that's cool. What's a common thread across the book? Certainly, looking at all these different cases and, and trying to synthesize them is. That interop is a real design <coughs> challenge. Um, the smart city example is a great one. If we think about making a city, the city's transportation system more efficient, uh, we really need to think hard about the different elements that need to play together, the workflows, the organizational models, and, and so forth. So um, the first challenge, and we will get to back get back to this question is really how do we determine if interop is a spectrum? Where exactly do we want to be on this spectrum and have systems work together? And then the second challenge is how to get there as a design and planning process. It turns out once you mess up with interoperability, it's actually very hard to create it. Um, uh, take uh, air traffic control uh, as, as another example. Uh, it's very hard once you have a given technology in place and you know a high degree of complexity actually to do, to move to the next version of uh, a system using new technologies such as GPS turns out actually in air traffic uh, we don't use GPS uh, that much as we actually use it otherwise all the time for navigational purposes so there are uh, uh, real uh, issues um, where it's easier to plan for interoperability rather to create it once um, you have a system in place. What also has become clear from this introduction video, uh, looking at smart cities, just very briefly of course, is that there are many benefits to highly interconnected systems. Um, when the video showed uh, healthcare and the efficiency uh, you can introduce there when you share information such as uh, health records across institutions. Um, the example also showed uh, firefighters and, and other first responders working together, how this may enhance uh, safety in a city. Uh, there was an argument about uh, ecological benefits, uh, more efficient water supply, more efficient utilities, again as one of the effects of increased levels of interoperability. And that's a finding across many of the case studies we looked into. 
that indeed interop uh, increases um, system effic systems efficiency, that it also increases user autonomy and choice. Uh, straightforward if you can uh, take whatever uh, uh, device you want uh, or cell phone you want and access any app store you want, you have more choice as a consumer if things are interoperable. Turns out, of course, they're not always interoperable. Uh, and John mentioned that at the beginning also one of the core findings certainly is that more interop is good for innovation and, and we'll return to that. Just very briefly, um, John already made this point uh, with the headlines uh, that he mentioned at the very beginning. Um, the, the story told in the book and in our research is, is not only a story about the technological layer and the data layer of interoperability, of course those matter a lot. Uh, go back to the uh, smarter cities example and uh, um, uh, first responders, emergency services, uh, to map those on, on the different layers. Of course, the police forces and the firefighters need to be able to connect uh, at the technological and data layer. Their radios need to communicate with each other to be more efficient and provide uh, uh, increased safety to the citizens in a city. Uh, but then there are also higher level interoperability questions that are equally important. Um, human interoperability turns out that for many years police forces and firefighters and ambulances use different language, different coded language uh, to signal emergencies and uh, there was no interoperability because code 333 meant a man down in the police jargon and something different like, you know, we have a a barbecue that got out of control in, in, in the other case and, uh, and so this coded language uh, problem, uh, the lack of interoperability is just an illustration of um, the human layer interoperability and we see that human inter uh, layer interoperability as a challenge across many of the apparently technical case studies we studied. And then on top of that is institutional layer of interoperability uh, uh, where organizations come into play, where also laws uh, come into play, uh, where actually you know, the laws of Europe may not be interoperable with the laws of the US. If you uh, consider the example of privacy protection, you have very different laws in Europe than here, uh, which makes it very hard, for instance, for international companies such as Google and Microsoft and many others to, um, to operate on a global scale. Uh, to stick with the um, rescue first responders example, in 9-11, uh, the institutional layer interoperability um, or the lack thereof was a, a, was a, a matter of life and death even uh, because um, the police helicopters, they actually did see that the towers um, were unstable and you had all the, uh, the layers of interop down there. They could communicate with the firefighters and so forth. But the firefighters in the tower basically said, well, that's not our chain of command. We're not following the orders uh, from the police helicopter because we're firefighters. So we have also high level jurisdictional interoperability problems. So that's just one example here. Uh, a second one uh, that I want to uh, touch upon are open platforms. This uh, uh, highlights the point that John mentioned at the beginning um, that interop is really good most of the time, especially in the digital uh, networked environment for innovation. And open platforms such as uh, Facebook are great interop stories. Um, John already uh, made this point, so I won't go into that in great detail. We'll mention though that um, when Facebook opened its application programming interface made available um, the possibility for other services and application builders to communicate with Facebook, uh, we have seen a, a spike in innovation. So 4,000 applications within a couple of months were uh, created by non-Facebook entrepreneurs uh, that then plugged into Facebook as apps. I'm sure many of you use apps uh, and get the idea here. So you see how uh, a decision made by Facebook to become more interoperable uh, led to uh, innovation, at least in, uh, horizontally. Another example or story to tell is Twitter, where we see a similar um, effect on opening up 
interfaces, making more interoperable one particular service, how that leads to more innovation and much of the story behind Twitter is actually also an interop story again. There are also less commercial example and more human examples of interop in this open platform space. I just want to highlight one that's the Ushahidi um, Haiti platform in the aftermath. And, and this is just another illustration of the power of interoperability across the different layers I just mentioned. Um, in the aftermath of the Haiti uh, earthquake, um, a bunch of students and volunteers actually created using a platform that was developed by a HLS graduate, by the way, um, created the most powerful and most important crisis coordination mapping tool uh, for the recovery efforts and relief efforts in, in Haiti, where actually um, volunteers that helped in Haiti, uh, first responders, could use whether it's Twitter, whether it's SMS, whether it's laptops, uh, or even phone calls to uh, map on a literal map where is help most needed, uh, how does the damage look like in given areas of the city, uh, what kind of uh, support, what of kind of uh, devices do we need for our relief efforts. Uh, so the power here, of course, as you see immediately, is a couple of volunteers build a platform, use a platform that is highly interoperable uh, to do really good uh, and, and actually become a very important driver in a, in, a, in a crisis, in a moment of crisis like this earthquake. It's worth pointing out, of course, again, you see how you need to have lower level interop. Twitter connects the data set from Twitter, connects to the map here. But then over time, there is certainly also the human layer of interoperability where uh, first responders start to coordinate, work together, going back to what John said, the arts and science of working together. And now also at the policy layer, for instance, the UN got really interested in these mapping techniques as an efficient way to coordinate relief efforts. And you have conferences hosted by the UN. So at the top institutional level, uh, thinking hard about how much interconnectivity do we need to have in this decentralized world where we have many relief uh, workers. There are less serious examples. Uh, uh, safe to p.org, right? If you look for a restroom, it's the same idea that applies here. So uh, looking from at, it, at these examples and many more case studies from a more theoretical perspective, we see this cycle that more innovation increases competition, which then in turn leads uh, to more uh, innovation. There are numbers of, of theories that support that in addition to case studies. I have to say one of the struggles that John and I had writing this book is there is not much empirical evidence out there uh, that supports uh, this claim that interop is good for innovation. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence and case studies. Um, but also, and that's comforting, of course, support uh, uh, through theory. I think Jonathan Citrain is, is here. I've seen him before. Oh, yeah. Hello. Welcome. Um, his theory of generativity, von Hippel's, um, Professor von Hippel's uh, concept of user-driven innovation, small step innovations, that these are some of the theoretical approaches to explain uh, and support uh, the claim we're making. And we can go into that in greater detail during the discussion. So it's important to note for the economists in the room or people watching us later on that it's not always the case that more interop uh, is good for innovation. There are instances where if companies um, have the hope to create a new product or service that isn't interoperable with other services, they actually get the entire market share, uh, the entire market instead of just a slice of the market and therefore have uh, something that is close to monopoly profits which may increase, of course, the incentive to innovate because you have the hope to get huge revenues, right? So there are caveats. I think uh, since we're at the old school, we uh, <coughs> keep it short on this one uh, for the moment. Uh, there is also uh, another argument why interop is good for innovation, and that's not only because it enables these great um, cases as we just uh, touched upon, but also it helps to spread and helps with the adoption of innovation. The transition to high definition TV in the US is a great story where actually only once interoperability be between analog TV sets 
and digital programming was enabled, people like us switched from analog to digital TV. And it's also a nice story because, and we'll get back to that in a few minutes, that's also an example where the government had to intervene uh, and actually send out coupons to households uh, so that we could buy converter sets uh, to make this transition successful, which has taken much longer than the government uh, predicted to start with. Example three, uh, only briefly, and I hope we can um, get more into that during the discussion. Credit cards, of course, credit cards are a highly interoperable system. Whatever you know, your shopping opportunity is, you swipe your card, whether it's a Visa, a MasterCard, or Annex, or whatnot. Uh, and you know, whatever your bank is, whether it's Bank of America or City or whatnot, uh, uh, this transaction works ultimately and, and the, uh, the store or the seller uh, gets, gets the money. So it's a highly interoperable system, super convenient if you look at the consumer data convenience is also one of the main reasons why people actually use credit cards. But of course, as we all, all know, um, this high level of interoperability comes with certain costs and risks. We all uh, read the stories about uh, identity theft, about uh, privacy problems and security problems, data breaches, almost every day, headlines in New York Times and elsewhere. Um, recently, uh, Sony uh, that lost like 75 million consumer uh, uh, records uh, due to a hacker attack. So you see how more interoperability actually uh, increases vulner vulnerabilities. Now our argument is um, that actually that's true, there are costs to higher levels of interoperability, especially in terms of privacy, as Tom noted, and, and security. But that these are, again, uh, costs that we need to uh, address or prevent ultimately in the design process when we think about uh, the creation of the next generation of technology. So the reason, only briefly, why I just love this illustration. Uh, Seung Ming, thank you for creating this slide. Um, the reason why more interoperability creates certain vulnerabilities arguably is because you have more connection points. You have more people, organizations, and so forth that tap into naturally into a data flow and can misuse, of course, the data that is exchanged in these highly interoperable networks. If you would only have a connection between here and there, you would have a lower uh, uh, risk uh, accumulated risk, then you have so many different uh, points of connection. Example four, that's actually my favorite one, um, cell phone chargers. Uh, many of you know, of course, or may have many uh, uh, um, chargers in your drawer. I have like gazillion of them, right? From my previous cell phones, like one for Nokia, one for my iPhone, another one for my old Blackberry. So I have, I have a real collection at home. I think many, how many of you? Many of you as well? Yeah, many of you, good. And, um, and, and their interoperability is a real question, right? Because it would be super convenient if you could use one particular charger for all the devices. And actually it's hard to figure out why has no one come up with this solution? Uh, because it, again, uh, turns out um, there are huge benefits to that. Now, the first stage of evolution was to make cell phone chargers smarter. Here are just uh, a few examples. Uh, one is uh, if you have a gas mask through breathing, you can charge uh, your cell phone. And on, another one is, uh, is the uh, air con. Uh, where you have through uh, wind, you will uh, charge your cell phone. And the craziest one is if your cat is playing with this, uh, then it charges as well. So this is kind of more on the funny side of things, but now let's see what actually um, has happened in Europe um, to address uh, this problem of um, diversity and non-interoperability of cell phone. Until now, if you changed mobile phones regularly, this often meant owning multiple incompatible phone chargers. These different chargers are a pain for users and produce waste, which harms the environment.
Today, a single common mobile phone charger, which can be used to charge different mobile phones made by different manufacturers, has been made possible. Based on the micro USB standard, the new charger is compatible with data-enabled mobile phones, and soon these kinds of mobile phones will be predominant on the EU market. The new charger exists thanks to the EU powers of persuasion. It managed to convince manufacturers who make up 90% of the European mobile phone market to agree on a common charger model. A common charger will make everyone's lives easier. So no again, problem. a great story, I think. And since we uh, talked about the EU at the beginning and the crisis in Greece and the Euro, I thought I you know, want to include at least one positive story, <laughs> even if it's only about cell phone chargers. But uh, w why is this case study in of interest, uh, leaving aside our, you know, that we are all affected as users of cell phones? Um, I think one point that is really interesting about it is how long it can take to achieve higher levels of interoperability, in this case, you know, the, the, the unified charger to agree on this standard. That, of course, has to do in, in many situations with the fact that you have many actors in the cell phone charge example, many different producers of cell phones, and they, for a, a number of reasons, uh, of course, economic reasons, uh, first and foremost, have no interest that you can also uh, use and charge your cell phone with the competitor's charger and therefore try to lock in consumers in the, into their product line and make money by selling uh, chargers uh, and cell phones, of course. Um, another reason we see in many systems is, especially in complex systems, health, health care is a great um, illustration there is that it's hard to achieve interoperability due to the complexity of a system. I save that for the discussion. I hope we'll have some more time to look into that. Legacy problems, I, uh, legacy problems, I already mentioned that in the air traffic control context. Uh, once you use one technology, it's very hard to change high switching costs. Keyboards, great story, QWERTY, standard, all the keyboard layouts we use, totally inefficient. We know there are more efficient layouts but the switching costs are too high, so sti we stick with something uh, that is actually not the best available technology, not the most efficient one due to such uh, problems. The cell phone charger example is also nice because it indicates the different ways how you can uh, and who can work towards higher levels of interop. Um, in this video, it uh, is the European Commission with some pride saying, well, our, you know, convincing power actually uh, uh, led to this higher level of interop. In fact, of course, it was nothing else than regulation by threat, right? <laughs> the European Union, the Commission threatened the producers of cell phones and chargers. Uh, if you don't find a solution to that problem, we will mandate the standard. And, um, that's an interesting uh, 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 you know, kind of tool in the toolbox. There are many mores, uh, more in, in the book. We explore uh, a broad range of, of instruments that we can use. Uh, some of them are more on the private uh, sector side. Others are more on the regulatory side, uh, approaches through uh, legislators and, and uh, regulators, state actors mandating standards, something we uh, don't recommend generally. We don't think governments do a good job in, in figuring out what the best standard is for a, for a technological problem. But uh, on the other hand, uh, governments are actually doing a really good job in convening different stakeholders. Again, here, the cell phone charge example is illustrative. And then you have a, a lot of um, tools in the toolbox on the private sector side to increase interop. Uh, we, will go, we will not go through all of, of those, of course. Uh, the baseline here is it, there is no one single way to interrupt. And the challenge is really to figure out what's the best mix of tools to solve or address a particular interrupt challenge, be it in uh, healthcare, be it in transportation, or any of the other areas we just mentioned. And uh, that's not a simple task. And this goes back to this notion of interrupt as a design uh, challenge. I think with that, I turn it over to you for the last example, John. Of course, thank you. And as you can see, we get very excited about these many examples. And I think that's one of the reasons that we spent 
several years working on this book was you kept getting excited about new examples. And I, uh, this is a warning, which is if you start thinking too much about interop, you see interop problems everywhere. And so it actually gets a little scary. Um, but one of the places that I see lots of interop problems is where I've spent uh, much of my last four years, which is working in libraries. And I'm so delighted to see many library friends here too. And I thought I would use this as uh, our closing example before we uh, get to some questions. I think libraries actually are a wonderful um, view into the problem of interoperability um, and in some fairly troubling ways, actually. Um, we cover two topics in particular depth in the book. One is electronic health records, which we're not getting into. It's a wonderful, thorny uh, problem why we don't have a higher level of interoperability within electronic health records, despite all this political will to do it. The other area where we go in depth, and this is because of our geeky interest in preservation of knowledge, is in libraries. And I think there are two things that really um, uh, stand out of these case studies. Um, the first is to think about the preservation of knowledge over the long term as an interoperability problem. Um, and it takes the form of interop today in the context of e-lending, which is the sort of present crisis in books. Um, but it also has to do with interop over time, which has to do with the reformatting of materials. So just as a way into the topic, you probably have somewhere in your home a series of little um, disks, computer disks that are uh, three and a half inches or four or five and a quarter inches or perhaps um, those USB sticks that you now have but ultimately won't be that useful. And if you think about it, they're extraordinarily, extraordinarily unhelpful to have um, those old disks. You do not have any way to play them unless you've kept successive versions of your computer. There's a wonderful computer history museum on the West Coast where you could go and you know, punch them in and actually render the data. But the print version is much more useful than those outdated technologies that shift over, um, over time. And this is a real problem for libraries and cultural heritage institutions and others who are thinking seriously about how we preserve knowledge over time. So let me talk about today and then the long term. So the, the today problem is this very weird, perverse situation in which libraries find themselves, which is um, if you end up trying to provide digital copies of books, you often can provide much less than if you provide physical copies of books to people, even though increasingly people want these digital books. So how does this work? Um, five of the six major publishers today in the United States will not let libraries get digital copies for the purpose of lending. That's one of the problems. Um, another of the problems is that even if you could, not everybody has the same kinds of readers. There's not a standard, a good open standard format for books that everybody um, uh, agrees to when they publish. It's not that they don't exist, it's that they haven't been adopted in the market, and libraries have yet to be able to exert enough control to ensure that that is so. It would make a lot of sense to have uh, a new book provided on an open standard that we've all agreed upon and have libraries have access to that and lend it out. And of course, publishers, I love our publisher and others, um, and MIT Press, our uh, publisher for other books, we want them to get paid and we want authors to get paid and we could absolutely find ways to ensure that that happens. But today we have a system where much of the time you can't actually get the book in the first place from the publisher to be able to lend it as a library. And secondarily, even if you could, people wouldn't necessarily have the right devices on which to play it. This is crazy, right? Why is this still a better technology than an ebook? That just doesn't make all that much sense. That's the kind of present day version of the internet problem. But it gets much more interesting and much more complex over time, which is increasingly libraries are spending more and more of their budgets on the electronic copies of knowledge rather than on the physical copies, right? We are being told users want data, users want electronic things, so cancel that print in our library here at the Harvard Law School. Um, despite the fact that our budget goes up every year in the library, we have to cancel because we can't keep up with the rising um, prices and because people want it in digital formats, and digital it turns out, oddly enough, to be more expensive. So if what libraries end up having is digital copies of things, but not so many of the physical copies, and then the equivalent of going from the three and a half inch disc to the five and a quarter inch disc or to the um, little USB stick happens, um, which has happened relatively quickly, right, over the last um, several years, um, we will have gotten access to a fair amount of information that will not have been preserved effectively over time. Now, obviously, there are lots of ways that one could think about solving this, but it turns out that even computer scientists think this is a relatively hard problem, which is how do you ensure that we can continuously um, update materials. Now, we make a fairly complex suggestion in a chapter in this book that there ought to be a deposit of a copy, a digital copy, um, with a particular registry and it should be kept in an open access 
uh, type of format, you're following an open standard, and therefore we can always be sure to update it, and that's the sort of interoperability over time. But today we have no such system. When they're created as digital files, they're held in these various hands in various formats, and if we all switch from one to the next, or switch on a various um, basis, we will have done less well than books in this format. That just seems to me completely crazy and a really interesting and hard interop problem. I think there's a lot that we can do knowing what we know about interoperability, knowing what we know about open access and open standards and so forth, but we're not doing it today. And we are rushing very, very quickly into this new world of knowledge without having solved this particular problem. So in a sense, I think the argument that we are making here is that when it comes to climate change, which is the case of the, uh, the smart grid, or electronic health records, which is um, the instance of uh, trying to improve the healthcare system through highly interoperable systems or preservation of knowledge, interop matters both as a theory and as a practice. And that from the IT realm or from systems like transportation um, and currency and so forth, we know how to make it work, um, but we also need to do it by design up front and to have a sense of how interoperable we want it to be, what's optimal, and how we cut off some of the problems like privacy and security that are often attendant with high degrees uh, of interoperability. And maybe Ursh, I'll turn it over to you for uh, some hard questions. No, I get to close it out. All right, very good. <laughs> very funny. He leaves me with the hard questions. Yeah, very nice. Uh, because I'm leaving, that's true. Thank you. Not, not going far up the street. Um, so we'll leave you with a few questions. We have not actually answered all of the questions in uh, this book or otherwise. There are more books to be written on interop in our view. Um, uh, how much interoperability um, and for what purpose I think is a key one that one has to answer in the, um, in the case of any of these uh, tricky complex uh, questions. How to get there, um, in many respects we think that there are a variety of different techniques that can be used and we need the subtle and nuanced assessment of costs and benefits in these cases. Um, and we could push on whether some things tend to be better approaches. Are open standards generally a better approach than proprietary standards processes? Yes and why? Um, but ultimately, um, we uh, uh, adopt a framework that said there are many different ways to get there. Um, the role of government, I think, is one of the most uh, uh, controversial aspects of uh, the argument. Um, we do not come from the purely libertarian strand of technologists that said the government has no rule. Um, we think that there are times and places where the government can help. Um, on the other hand, there are not um, uh, always um, uh, roles for the government at every stage of the process, and it's not always the case um, the governments are the most effective, um, and trying to figure that out is something that we um, create a framework for in the book. Um, and then last, of course, this, this notion that even if you get to interoperability at one moment in time, how do you manage it over time? And I think this actually is, in some ways, the hardest one. Air traffic control is a perfect example from my perspective, which is we figured out a way um, as of a few decades ago to get to a pretty good version of air traffic control. But as new technologies have come along, we haven't introduced them because we've gotten locked in at a certain um, level. Uh, and I think we can see that across many different um, complex um, systems. And the very last one as a hard question that we leave up there um, for all the academics in the room are methodological challenges. I see my friend Esther Hargitay there with whom I've taught a class on methodologies. Um, this is actually a really hard question to try to figure out how do you study this and understand um, reliably the answers. We adopted a case study approach um, but to the extent that there are better empirical um, or other ways to study it, um, that over time uh, may well help come up with better solutions to the interoperability problems. Um, with that, thank you so much for the chance to be with you. So by my uh, clock, we have about 10 minutes until uh, drinks and so forth outside. Um, so if anyone has uh, thoughts, questions, challenges, Doc Searles? Oh, we have a mic, we'll, because we are uh, recording, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, Doc Searles. Are there any where you say, you know what, give up, it's not gonna happen? What an awesome question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a cockeyed optimist. You know, every glass is like, you know, is completely half full no matter how much is in the, in the water. So I, I don't think we found, uh, that we didn't come to one where we thought it's just too hard. I, I felt that the electronic, so electronic health records was the one in the US. Uh, in the US which I think we thought ultimately was hardest. So if you're the Danes and you have a few million people and or you've the got Swiss for that or the Swiss for that matter, very good. <laughs> Although I think the Danes might be a little further ahead than you on this, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, and relatively um, 
let's say, sort of contained political system and so forth, you can get to a relatively high degree of, um, of interop. But as you know, in the US and the UK, you've had you know, Prime Minister Blair at the time, and you've had multiple US presidents, President Bush and President um, uh, Obama, say we're going to get to electronic health records in the US by certain dates, 2014, I think most recently. And despite the fact that there's political agreement that this is a good thing to do, oh, by the way, there are privacy concerns, but um, we just simply haven't gotten there. So I don't believe that there's uh, an unsolvable interrupt problem, but that one is, I think, the one that uh, is the hardest. Hi, Mark Tomizawa. So I also saw at Berkman the gentleman who did the uh, work on the consultation problem, which was how does government conduct consultations with experts from across the United States. If you put that idea together with the idea that we're all addressable via our devices, what would it take to create an expert network of embedded people who just constantly report in what they're seeing? Because in an emerging dynamic system, what you need to do is put the sensors in the right places. Well, what if the sensors are mines? That's a great question. So uh, to a certain extent, this is happening, right? Uh, when we think about the Internet of Things, which also include human sensors. Uh, uh, so there uh, indeed is you know, this trend towards connecting everything, uh, which of course comes also with risks. And uh, the special case of experts, I would argue, uh, we have lots of expert uh, expert networks that have emerged on in whether it's in in medicine, whether it's in in other areas of science, whether it's uh, uh, experts addressing governance governance problems. Um, so I totally see that happening. Of course, enabled by the technology that um, we described a little bit in this presentation that fosters. Uh, from the bottom up, these higher level and enables these higher levels of human interoperability. So um, that's the power of the technology uh, that it lowers the costs for making these human connections possible ultimately. And I think is also the most powerful argument why I'm interested and, and uh, enthusiastic about uh, the digital environment, um, despite all the downsides, of course, that we acknowledge no as well. I think we're in the experimentation stage, uh, you know, and that's perhaps a good thing. And this is a great one in particular, just to add one additional note is, it's not clear to me that we want that mode of governance, like that we could handle that level of interconnection, right? I mean, I think lots of people might think, oh, that's great, we get lots of consultation, but I don't know if direct democracy enabled it that way is something that we could, in fact, be able to manage. Oh, I'm sorry, I have three questions. Okay, but, but may, could, maybe could we just try one per, just because there are a lot of hands? Do you uh, mind doing one question? Okay. Uh, Your favorite one, and we'll talk to you <laughs> after about the other two. One. We can also okay. vote them up or down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or you can ask all three and we'll answer okay, one. Okay. Do you think a human's, uh, human's dreams can be controlled by someone else? Uh, I don't think we have addressed that question in this book, um, first of all. Um, so have human, can human dreams be addressed, uh, controlled by somebody else? Um, nor do I have a particular uh, insight into that, so I'm sorry. Uh, what so, you talked about today included the social system, not only technology system, is right? Yes, I think, I think that's completely right. That what, so, what we're looking at is there are social systems as well as technological. Impact. Social system include every citizen, is right? I think they, they certainly could. I think that's the, the governance example we just heard, actually. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, that's the question. If it, if it is me, I had this kind of experience. Would you like to tell me what's your response? Res what, what's your response? Maybe we'll talk to you about it after, but I, I don't. I'm afraid I don't. Oh. I don't have an insight into this into this particular problem. I'm sorry. Not not one. Not a okay, question we you. we know enough to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm an anthropologist by training, and curious if you thought about the limits that you would like to see emerge on interop. I'm thinking in particular of the problem in biological systems of hypercoherence things that are too tightly wound together. For example, a single species of, of uh, rice or corn that has been 
regarded as more efficient and in interoperability terms um, often regarded as a real advance, uh, can turn out with one blight of rust to have been a big mistake. And working towards interoperability, in a sense, was building into a whole system um, self-suicide in some sense. So there are a lot of people doing thinking in biological systems, for example, um, how to build in questions of self-limit in order to avoid the hypercoherence and then collapse. And it would seem to me the big great uh, realm in which you guys could help us think about the limits we would like to see imposed on interoperability. Not just the privacy questions, but the fact that we live as one species in a multi-species, millions of species uh, system, and we are doing much too much to make it efficient for ourselves and hypercoherent and therefore suicidal. It's a brilliant question. It's yeah. a wonderful point, and uh, we try to address it in the book somewhat uh, in, a, in a chapter on diversity. Uh, which is inspired actually by biology in terms of biodiversity and translate that into the technological environment. And I think there is a key conceptual uh, clarification necessary. When we talk about interoperability, and this ties back to the different tools, how to work towards higher interoperability, we do not uh, suggest to make systems identical, to merge them, to unify things. Actually, to the contrary, in our view, um, interoperability is a way to preserve diversity, but also prevent fragmentation within diversity. So have enough diversity, uh, but still enable communication among uh, these diverse components within a system. Uh, now, it's extremely difficult to find out case by case where is this optimum. Uh, and it's extremely difficult also to think about uh, the speed bumps you want to build into such systems. Uh, of course, very different in biology than uh, when we talk about uh, Facebook or any uh, tech context. But uh, very much, yes, that's part of our thinking. And um, we, I think, only uh, made the first few steps uh, towards um, learning more from various disciplines and, and uh, thinking about the design repertoire uh, from that perspective, for sure. But I think you've drilled right to the core of what we think is the long-term implication of this of the study, and we'd we'd welcome others taking it from here or or talking more about the um, well, pieces we don't know. Well, have colleagues that work on it, you yep. might want to bring in that literature because the question they pose, quite simply, is that humans in ecosystems maximize for gross return, whereas. Um, ecosystems move in another direction altogether. In other words, humans maximize for something and ecosystems maximize for something else. And it's that intersection that will be the crucial question of where do you set limits. Wonderful. There's lot, I'm just coming out of a conference with biologists, so I'm totally with you. That's oh, for a body of, of literature we haven't, uh, we yeah, haven't that's digested. Right. That's but. good. Uh, maybe two more and then we'll, uh, we will uh, adjourn. Um, you mentioned a couple of the different benefits of interoperability as uh, user autonomy, economic growth, and efficiency. And I would say that those three things uh, are potentially at odds with each other. And so when you go blindly towards uh, interoperability, and you guys mentioned monopoly very, very briefly uh, as a, a danger there, um, you end up losing out user autonomy to the economic growth and the efficiency factor. Uh, how important do you think decentralized systems are going to be as we look at inter interoperability going forward? To it's me, sort of related, but a little bit more technical. No, to me, it's, it's absolutely a variation on the same theme, right? So I can give the same answer again. We're not uh, arguing in favor of one uniform system, for instance, that we only have uh, uh, one type of cell phones. That, that's exactly not what we're arguing for. But uh, the argument we try to present, and I think where you have often a significant overlap or congruence between the different policy goals, such as user autonomy and innovation, is to, f to work towards that sweet spot of the right level of interconnectedness, the uh, right level of um, you know, 
ability to to mash up applications and use different devices for various purposes and and to aim for that optimum that's kind of the search uh, or the quest of, of what you're working on i think you're right that lots of these things are in tension with one another but i think there are highly complex systems where many of them can coexist. And I actually think the web is a really good example of that. I think email systems, maybe the emerging social web, are ones where you have high degrees of diversity. You have enough standardization that information can flow. And you have a great deal of user choice and innovation. I think you actually can design really interesting, complicated systems where those things do. And, and that's this kind of sweet spot in the biological zone, too. So it's, it's, it's right to see the tensions. Um, and it's why the, the topic is so rich, I think. Maybe one last one on this side, since we have not passed the mic this way. Sung Min has got. Hi, thanks so much. Um, Thank I wanted to push back a little bit on your cell phone charger example. Great. I think it's actually illustrative. I definitely agree there's a big convenience uh, boon to interoperable standardizing on micro USB. But there might be not only a performance trade off, like a sort of modularity trade-off where you can't choose the optimum voltage or the optimum current if you're standardizing on 5 volts and 500 milliamps, but also a, maybe an innovation deficit if you can't do things like have special magnetic plugs or waterproof plugs or designed exactly right for the particular type of device. So I'm just curious if you could comment on, on that both from the performance side but also from the innovation side since you specifically mentioned innovation as something that's usually helped by interoperability. Please. You uh, used the cell phone one. You <laughs> bragged about your you yeah. it together. I know, so. I know. Um, no, agreed again. This, uh, this is one of the potential uh, uh, downsides and costs of interoperability that it may lock you in, especially when you the, interop, the means to get to interop is choosing a particular standard, right? Then you run the risk that you freeze actually this standard for the future, and that you know some variations of the standard or better solutions may not be adopted uh, in due in due course. So one of the additional challenges to all of the ones we already identified is how can we incorporate mechanisms of learning into standard setting in particular and keep open the conversation while at the same time also of course benefiting from settling on a certain standard for a certain amount of time. A great case study in that uh, area is of course cell phone standards uh, where some countries have stepped in early on and regulators and declared a certain standard to be the standard, the mandatory standard which has led to huge innovation but then, of course, also create some sort of lock-in. And how can we overcome uh, this problem? That's another um, governance uh, and uh, mechanism design challenge we, we haven't figured out where we're still in the stage of experimentation and learning. I think another way to see this is certain instances, I think it's OK to go for something that is more standardized rather than more diverse and just merely interoperable. And cell phone chargers, I think, are sort of an example of that, where I don't think there's so many layers, to use Jonathan's notion of generativity, above cell phone chargers, as there are in other instances where I would argue for not doing that and going for more diversity. But I think that's exactly the conversation you have to have every time. So I might um, take this as the moment, um, first of all, to say a big thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, a second thank you is to the Berkman Center team and those who have worked with us uh, on this project for a long time. We've devoted this book, dedicated this book to the Berkman Center team for teaching us what human interoperability um, is all about. And on a uh, particular personal uh, note, um, my closest of friends, best friend, Urs Gasser, I've been so, so, so glad to have the chance to work with this a second book um, with you. It is a vastly better book, at least from my perspective, than I certainly could have written alone. Um, and I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank you, Thank you so much.